Welcome to Living Outside the Matrix, the show where we explode modern myths and question some of the assumptions of the mainstream cultural narrative. Hi there, I'm your host, Nigel Howitt, and on the show today we're going to look at that rather broad concept of how we raise our young people, how we raise the next generation. So um, parenting is quite a broad concept and it probably means a lot of things to, to different people so but that's what we're going to look at today from a, a particular perspective of, of a relationship around mutual respect so to discuss that uh, with me today is uh, Rosalind Ross who is a fellow thinker and objectivist and she's writing a book a forthcoming book about her theory around this mutual respect parenting so looking forward to hearing all about that Rosalind Ross very warm welcome to the show hi um, no my book a theory of objectivist parenting is out uh, the one I'm working on now is uh, about bringing children about reality okay fantastic well that's great that's a nice one so how did you get into this parenting thing Rosalind what's your background um, I started working with children when I was in college and then after college um, you know, in high school, I had learned how to cook by working in restaurants. So I thought, well, I want to learn how to uh, be a great mom by working with children. I would like to get paid to educate myself and make my mistakes with other people's kids. Yeah. And um, I ended up, uh, just because I'm such a voracious reader, I um, moved up very quickly in my career to being a um, executive nanny um, specializing in behavior modification working with children that were disappointing their parents in some way and, and fixing that. And um, at the time, I had already, I was already an objectivist, and um, my theory of how parents would be in Galt's Gulch, that was always the game I played with myself, at the time was they'd be like just really hardcore, strict, like perfect benevolent dictators, and those children would be the most well-behaved children in the world, and it would all be you know, obviously they have to be good students because you're an objectivist and you value thinking. And um, and so I, I really approached it that way. And I read books on parenting and they, you know, they confirmed what I, what I thought. I was reading just straight academia at the time. And, um, you know, you reward the behavior you wish to see continue. You punish the behavior you wish, wish to see cease. And um, in doing that, working um, for extremely wealthy families, I trained children like 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 dogs <laughs> yeah in, in pretty much the same sort of fashion that we all fall into these traps before we really start to think about what we're doing I mean but but yes yeah, so, so please go on well so I ended up being quite confused that um, I had a one particular case where where a girl was um, obese and and flunking out of school and I worked with her for a while and she was an honor roll student who was not obese anymore and, and you know healthy and uh, it didn't make her very happy and it seemed to me that she was actually a much happier more real and vibrant version of herself back when she had been the the uh, obese flunking out girl and it was a very interesting problem that I was trying to figure out why wouldn't why wouldn't you be happy on the honor roll and, and thin like that doesn't make any sense no. um, so I had to really question I started to question the the dogma that I had been reading and I started to read other things and um, I encountered better ideas okay I should say for listeners that objectivism is the philosophy of Ayn Rand um, based around reason as a central guiding principle and also that Galt's Gulch um, that Ross had just mentioned is, uh, is uh, a, a place within the story of uh, Atlas Shrugged her masterpiece just to catch people up on that yeah so um, so you were you were busy controlling little people into various desired outcomes obviously not their own chosen outcomes but the, the, the outcome was chosen by uh, caretakers and parents and, and noticing, so you, you, you clocked that that obviously didn't equate to happiness. Happiness or um, the sparkle, you know, the authenticity factor, because even if someone isn't happy, there's still a realness about them. If they're living their chosen life, then there is if, if they're not. Sure. So. Um, I ended up concluding that, um, yeah, and Galt's Gulch is the game that I would always play with my play in my head. 
Um, what would it be like in Galt's Gulch? How would parents be in Galt's Gulch? Galt's Gulch is the ideal, the ideal place, the ideal um, society. Okay. I ended up concluding that um, I initially had been completely wrong and that ideal parents in Galt's Gulch would actually be more focused on relationships and respect and that um, a free society has to be based around those things. You can't actually uh, control children all their lives and then expect to have them create a free government or vote for freedom. They're going to grow up and vote for control if they've if control is all they've known. You don't magically change when you turn 18 into a freedom loving being. You no, that's right. I mean that that's uh, people. A lot of people that are starting to realize more and more that uh, obviously control coercion isn't the way forward in 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 human relationships in any shape or form. You know that there's it still seems to be a bit further to go to realize that you know the way we treat our children is is obviously you know integrity and actually living and expressing that message. Isn't it? But, but I must confess, it took me a while for it for things to intellectually percolate through. And, uh, and then, you know, you start to address our own programming, which I'm sure you, know, you probably know more about. We're all we're very programmable beings, aren't we? And that part of the problem is to try and change that programming. So, so t tell us a bit more about the, the sort of fundamental principle then, you know, this, this, this whole non-coercion, this mutual respect model, as opposed to the conventional model, which is it, is it behaviorism? Is it authoritative parenting? Is it controlling parenting? What would you call it? I, you know, I have read a lot of different books and people come up with fancy names for it. And, and I, it's the control, it's the world of control, the world in which controlling people is a good thing, in which people have to be controlled, in which children have to be controlled, in which, um, you know, oh, come on, just a little. Um, you know, human society can't function without just a little. And, um, and actually there's an element, a philosophical element too, of abstraction. The world of control um, is is almost a part of our brain. The way our brain works, it's the it's the abstract. You're not present talking to a real person in front of you. You're you're an abstract mother controlling this abstract child, and this is the uh, the appropriate behavior, or the appropriate social interaction that should be happening, mm -hmm. rather than being just the yourself in yes. the present. Moment, um, using your perceptual brain to perceive the being in front of you and um, decide what is needed in this current situation. You're living in the now. So it's almost as if there's, um, so there's the, there's the control paradigm and then there's the respect paradigm. Um, that's what I write about in, in my book. Um, trying to move over to the respect paradigm mm -hmm. is really hard, like what you were just saying. Um, and I don't even know how, I don't, I don't know, I don't think you have to live there all the time. I don't think you have to live in the present moment all the time. Um, but I do think that it, whenever you're struggling in your relationship, if you can take a deep breath and come into the present moment and use your perceptual faculties rather than your um, analytical faculties, you're going to do a lot better. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's uh, so just to, to pick up the thread again, if we can, can we look at what's wrong, the reasons why we wouldn't use sort of behaviorism, the controlling model, what doesn't it achieve? What, what problems does it create before we maybe go on and have a look at why we wouldn't do it this way? So, so, so we're controlling our children, we're making them go to bed at the right time, we're making them sit down at meal times, you know, everything's, where, where does that, where's that going to lead? Well, there's an interesting um, psychological phenomenon that happens there, and again, people describe it in different ways. Reading, reading psychology is basically being a translator, because every psychologist has a different describes it in a different way. Um, my favorite is Nathaniel Brandon. He calls it social metaphysics, and he talks about how um, if you use the reward and I don't know if he actually says it this way, but if you use the reward and punishment model, you're not training your you're not teaching your child not to hit, for example, you're teaching your child not to upset you, the parent. So okay. you're, you're taking away your child's, um, your child's values or whatever they were trying to get and replacing it with you as the value. And that is going to move, that's going to change your child's metaphysics from reality and what will cause him pain to people. People will cause me pain. Um, I don't need to study, understand and conquer nature. I need to study, understand and conquer my mother. If I want yeah. to avoid, um, okay, so, got you. Yeah, so so it's it's people are, are 
the young children are becoming less, or that that results in them becoming less reality focused and more more uh, appeasing focused, just please the people. Well, yeah, it's called social metaphysics. It's you know, um, Alfie Cohn writes a lot about this as well. He writes about how we used to believe, or he used to believe, that rewards and punishments take advantage of just a fundamental aspect of human nature. Um, but he believes now, after many years of research, that rewards and punishments turn humans into a different type of person, that a reward and a reward maximizing animal, if you mm, will. Yeah. The rewards and punishments are started and the more they're used, the less authentic the person will be capable of being by the time it, they're 18. I, su um, I suppose it's, a, if I just interject, it's rather like sort of um, somebody, if you're, if you're controlled, you're fundamentally not at the driving seat, are you? You're not in control. It's, a, it's an either or situation, isn't it? Either someone else is at the wheel, in which case you have to sort of adapt to moving over and, or, or copying or, or that whole different way of, of operating. Whereas, whereas when you get in the driver's seat, when, when we can somehow um, you know, raise children or all aspire to not being controlled, we're, we're necessarily better positioned to, to sort of live our own lives, as you say, achieve happiness and all that, aren't you? It seems a, it seems a very important thing to, for us to be doing. Yeah. No, that's a fantastic metaphor. Um, the, the child isn't in the driver's seat. The child is just being driven. And moreover, the child isn't even permitted to feel what he's feeling about where he's being driven. Like, no, you're happy about where you're being driven. You like good grades. You you want this. This is what you want. This is for your own good. Um, we do a lot of damage correcting our children's emotions too. It okay. starts with, and that's also dictating values as well, isn't it? So rather than encourage them to find their own, I suppose. Yeah, and it's um, Aletha Solter writes books about uh, control patterns in infants. By the time babies are six months old, most have learned to suppress what they're feeling because they've already learned that crying isn't good and it it makes it upsets their parents and they're not supposed to cry so they start thumb sucking um, this is not a behavior that's this is a behavior that's considered normal in the western world and not so much outside of the western world it's a little bit like wait what are they doing what's wrong with crying um <laughs> yep there, there, there aren't enough questions asked about things like that are they but it, it does all make sense when you when you uh when you, when you explain it the way you do, they're looking for a way to, to, to distract themselves away from uh, you know, not being allowed to express themselves authentically. Right. You're not supposed to feel that. You're not allowed to feel that. And we spend, in order to be admitted to preschool, you're supposed to be able to control your emotions to a certain extent. But I, um, no, no, no. Do, do they call it self-control? I, I forget. But um, what... They're not looking for, what does it mean to be in control of your emotions? It means often to not be aware of them and to repress or suppress them and just disconnect yourself from your emotional reality. Mm, which is never going to be a good thing, is it? No, that's, that's another thing is that emotions, um, I, I write about that too, it's that um, emotions are just information. They're, they don't have to control you, they don't have to be we think of them as rewards and punishments. Um, we we think of, you know, good boys and girls get to feel happy. When I'm good, I get to be happy. And when I'm bad, I'll feel bad. But that em emotions aren't rewards and punishments for, for good behavior. They are, they are just information about whether what you are doing is working. That's all they are. And if we judge our emotions, we can't even feel them. We can't even get the information that we wanted to get from them. Sure. I've heard it said also that that uh, happiness is fundamentally might be a, a rand idea. F happiness is fundamentally um, derives from achieving our own self-initiated goals, and it's so so the the things that we we do, whether it's you know building a model Lego thing as a child, or whether it's living the life you want to to lead, it's got to be your own plan, really, isn't it? Otherwise, so so this the controlling. That really gets in the way of you of a, of a child or a young person developing their own plan. Would you would you say? So. Yes, um, it, you can only experience, I guess, authentic happiness if you're in the driver's seat. Hmm. When you're the passenger, it's and you don't even get to decide where you're going and you don't get any input. It, is that happiness? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> 
Okay, so so the controlling aspect really doesn't work, and that's of course what what we're most of us most of us parents. I'm a parent. I've got three young children, uh, five, seven, and ten at the moment, and I'm very familiar with you know stress levels rising, and and uh, you know a bit of introspection. And I think most parents would agree that you know moments of stress, you know, we, it, it's harder to sort of think out the best plan of what to do. So. How how do we move then into this? Uh, help, help describe this mutual respect because I mean it sounds great, doesn't it? Mutual respect. Yeah, I'll, I'll have some of that. How how do we um, how does that look like at parenting? Well, um, so I guess my favorite uh, metaphor here is uh, it's psychological economics. Um, you can't give to your children what you don't have, so right. you don't have. Uh, the emotional skills to deal with your own strong emotions, you can't possibly expect to teach your children how to deal with their strong emotions. And they have very strong emotions, often. Mm. Um, so, one of the, so, the parent, is, the parent has to be the model. The parent has to go out and start doing a lot of introspection and a lot of work to reprogram and reparent him, his or her, him, himself or herself, um, which is kind of beautiful. Um, it's probably my favorite thing about working with children is that you really get to re-raise yourself and you get to re-habituate yourself to um, new patterns of responses. Um, I'm not going to pretend that it's natural at first. and It's really hard, I think. Um, I, in my book, I use concrete examples because I think that's easier for people to understand. Um, so. One of the classic examples is um, is a newborn baby. I, I use so I, I do the feeding example because a lot of people have eating issues these days, and especially um, and it's this is one of the areas where it's so clear that you can't control your children if you want them to be no, have a normal, healthy relationship with food. Like there can't be control. So when you have a newborn baby. You are told to tickle its cheek to make it to trigger the mouth opening reflex and shove your shove your nipple in its mouth and then um, it'll start nursing and you do that every two hours you try to get it on that two hour schedule and um, that's interesting that to me so in the respectful paradigm that would be really disrespect um, to trigger someone's reflex and shove something in their mouth is like wait what. Mm. Um, you can hold your nipple near the baby's nose, and if the baby, the baby will smell it, and if the baby wants to eat, it'll open its mouth and and eat. Yeah. Um, and then to do it every two hours again is also disrespectful, and it's really interesting too because these moms are trying to like teach the baby who's the boss. You know, you're gonna eat every two hours when when I say, uh, you know, not when you want, but when when the clock says, and. The moms think that they're the boss. They're not the boss. The alarm clock is the boss. And the person in academia who told her every two hours, they're the boss. You're not, you're not teaching your kid anything about bosses right now. Now, what's interesting is that a baby who is being fed, so the newborn baby who has to communicate with his mom, has to learn to communicate with his mom about when he's hungry and open his own mouth to eat, he's already learning to have, um, he's already learning that he gets to influence the world. When I when I'm hungry, I commute. I, I'm capable of communicating this. I'm capable of getting this need met. Yep. It doesn't. So so that's that's the first example. And that's a newborn baby, and so it's interesting to see that the other baby is not learning that he gets his needs met when he cries. He has to wait two hours. This arbitrary time that means nothing to him. He he doesn't learn that his needs get met, and he doesn't learn that he can communicate that he's hungry to his mom because. He just gets food shoved in his mouth, whether he wants it or not, every two hours. So just the amount of learning um, about one's efficacy in the universe is so different by six weeks in these two babies. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so uh, the next example, relationship, and tell me when you want me to stop. I think. No, no, go on, let's do another one. Um, now you have a one-year-old and they're teething and the mom is nursing and this baby bites their mom, right? And their mom... Um, in the control paradigm, it's her job to teach the baby not to bite. So she's like, she takes the baby, it's a bad baby. You know, now you're in the corner for one minute because you're one year old and timeouts are one minute long when you're one year old. And I'm going to teach you not to bite. That was bad. What this baby has learned is that it's not okay for him to want to bite. 
what he wants isn't okay and he's bad and he's bad when he tries to get what he wants and he probably shouldn't try to get what he wants you know sometimes because otherwise he's he's bad and he'll feel pain he'll be punished if he goes after what he wants the respectful mom um she would take the baby off her nipple and she would respond authentically she would look right into his eyes and she would say ow that really hurt me and then she would say but you want to bite let's let's find something that you can bite i don't want you to bite me but here look here's a doll you can bite the doll it won't hurt the doll so now what this baby has learned is that his mother doesn't like it when she bites him but that his desire to bite is fine and there's nothing wrong with him he's not bad he just he just needs to get his needs met in a different way yeah so and the 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 two things that they have learned are just so different um take a 4-year-old who uh who's eating um you know, when I, I like to say, you know, put a put the plate down in front of your kids and then don't look at it. It doesn't matter. It's it's their job. It's their responsibility. It's all them. We sorry to just interject it there, but we find that this is such a difficult one. I mean, just to bring a personal situation into it, it's so it's so untidy <laughs> to uh, to have meal times that, that, are, that are that chaotic and and uh, you know even the idea of bringing everybody together to the meal we try to un- encourage everyone to come to the meal um, and and fall short of actually sort of enforcing that they that they absolutely have to but but to lots of children and mine included just just don't want to eat things and it, and it's it is it's a real difficult one i think for, for parents to meet but but it sounds like from what you're saying that if we just bring a bit more consciousness and a bit more attention and everything to to the job of parenting I mean, it does it it is going to require more work isn't it to overcome the inertia i think at first i think at first i'm going to say the first five years it is infinitely more more difficult and then i think it's infinitely more easy mm. Great. Well, that's... Um, but let's talk about so um, with with feeding. Okay. Mm-hmm. Some some people read my parenting books and they think that them as the parents to be respectful to their children don't get to get their own needs met and don't get to have their own needs. And I I do not advocate that. I advocate a relationship where you are respectful to your child and you respect his needs and he is respectful to you and respects your needs and he might not know how. So you have to have certain boundaries that. These are these are my needs, and I am the this. So at my house, for example, I am the cook, and my kitchen is not open all day. I can't be your can't cook for you all day. I've got other things to do. That would be really rude to me and disrespectful to me if my kitchen is always a mess and there's always someone making a mess at the table. So I offer breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's what I offer, and um, you, I don't care if you eat it. But that's what I offer, and I don't offer, you know. It's and I don't want to make my sound sound like a or make myself sound like super strict. Nothing is ever strict because it's a relationship. Everything is always negotiable. But for the most part, if people try to um, get get take advantage of my generosity, like oh, mom, I forgot to have dinner. Or, oh, I didn't have enough dinner tonight. Like I'm hungry. If that starts to become a pattern every night, that's going to frustrate me, and I'm not going to punish you. But I'm going to tell you that I'm frustrated and I'm not happy with how this is working. This is actually really terrible for me. My, I, I need my kitchen to be cleaned up and things to be put away. I, so it's, I think it's important to remember that. In, being in clear, me, yeah, being clear on expressing our needs is it doesn't doesn't come naturally, does it? To think of even doing that, we get I think we get so stuck up in our own heads. Yes, and we we try to be stoic and oh everything's fine. Mm. Um, it with children, I think it's. Children are so capable of lo- wanting to respect your needs, and they, and especially when you work so hard to meet their needs, they love that they can do that in return. It makes them feel grown up. Right. Yeah. That they are capable. Yeah, that's a that's a lovely one. Yeah, and was it you who um, I first heard say that the method is the me- message, basically? So, so <laughs> with with this whole, you know, that applies to so many things, but on the whole idea of interacting with your children so so if we're just to hop back again to, to the controlling if if we're trying to make everything and uh, we're, we're taking responsibility for the layout of the day for all the, the choices everything that happens so if the method is the message when we when we do all this controlling stuff we're basically teaching our children that controlling is what we humans do aren't we we're, we're, we're demonstrating that that 
that is an effective way, or we think it's an effective way, of, of interacting with other human beings. We think it's all about controlling each other, which is which has disastrous consequences. You know, as as you say, pe- children don't suddenly change when they, you know, become eighteen or sixteen. You know, this this it has disastrous effects in in I think their 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 social assumptions, doesn't it? And and as you as you you alluded to this earlier on, being controlled. But hey, yeah. probably that was a bit of a tangent. I didn't want to pull you off course. Um, no, and the political sphere too. I mean, to me, the, the main problem is the the politics. Politics are the the ultimate consequence of the oh. idea of you. politics. That that is a relationship. A government yeah. is a relationship. And sure. if we want a different kind of relationship with our governments, we need to start at home. Yeah. So uh, the con- controlling is sort of breeding collectivists, really, isn't it? So I mean, at the, at the extreme end of it, certainly breeding people that are pre con- presupposed to that, you know, predisposed. Yeah. So what else can we look at with regards to parenting techniques that are, um, you know, more, you know, can you give us a few more practical examples of this mutual respect model? In you know, do you have any other sort of day to day examples you can throw? Favorite examples, um, mutual respect model. Okay, so some some of the questions I get on my blog, or some of the ones that people have been asking me recently, is you know what do I do about about TV? Um, do I do I allow my child you know TV? Um, so I never think about it in terms of what I allow and what I don't allow because I don't really see that as um, my that's not a part of my paradigm. No. Um, however, um, I don't own a TV. I wasn't raised with one. Uh, I have no desire to buy one. Um, that's and, great, uh, but you've, got, you've managed to avoid that issue right at, it, at its uh, origin. I mean, unfortunately, I mean, I, I would agree with you in the merits of not having a telly. Unfortunately, we do have one in my household. <laughs> and, uh, so, it's a lot better for me. <laughs> yeah. uh, and also, uh, when people are like, you know, your child being deprived or whatever it is they think happens when you don't watch TV, I'm like, oh, well, I was raised without TV, so okay. I turned you know, I don't, I'm not going to act like you can use that argument for everything, but I actually, not being raised with TV is my very favorite thing my parents did. Yeah. It's the great gift that they gave me. Um, to be raised without television is to become a reader, sure. and it's to become a free thinker, and to never have any idea what is going on in pop culture, and to understand that it really doesn't matter. No, that great <laughs> um, big, big distraction of, uh, you know, yeah, I pop know. culture. I feel like I have so much more time than, and don't get me wrong, because I don't have any free time, but I have so much more time to get things done than people who watch TV. It, whenever I do watch TV, it feels like the biggest time suck of all time. Um, I, and don't get me wrong, I enjoy a good movie. I, I do, and I enjoy a good, a good show, though I very rarely want to sit down and watch it. I, I don't mind playing it while I'm cooking something, but... Um, so with children then, if you were managing a scenario where you did have a, a TV, you know, is it a, is it a question of rationing hours, exchanging behavior? <laughs> what would give us the... Uh... Okay, so for example, I was going to say I don't have a TV, but I do have a computer. And any self-respecting kid knows how to watch TV on a computer these days. <laughs> sure. so, uh, so it's the same as the unlimited hours in, with, with the kitchen. Um, your needs matter. You're my son, and and you're a person, and your needs matter. My needs matter too. So let's talk about this. And um, in order for I, when I see you watching TV, this is how I feel. So it just it really depends on the person. You know, if you're if you're totally comfortable with your kids' TV watching habits, you know, there's no problem here. I'm not out to fix something no. that is a problem. If your kitchen is open all day and you don't mind it being a mess, there's no problem there. So I'm really into. Um, if there's no problem, it's not a problem. You don't need to do it the way I do it. Nobody does. Do what works for you. If it doesn't work for you, if you don't like how much TV your kid is watching, you talk to your kid about it. You're like, hey, um, I don't feel comfortable with how much TV you're watching. And so I bought this book. Um, it's called Remotely Controlled. It's about television. I'm wondering if this can be our evening reading book until to, to start a dialogue so that we can start talking about what your TV watching is doing to your brain and why I feel so much anxiety when I see you doing it. And obviously, um, the, the other thing is who owns the who owns the TV? Like if my son is trying to watch TV on my computer, that's going to be a problem. Yeah, obviously. sure. Sharing the use of the, of the device that comes into it. 
Right. And if you have a family and one TV and you have to negotiate that whole, like, whose turn is it, then, yeah, everyone should get together and come up with a plan that, mm. they, that they believe is fair. But when it comes to TV watching, I've read several books on the subject. Um, it is a really serious drug. And I'm not anti-drug. Well, that's not true. I mean, I, I am any, any substance, any humans can use anything as a spice, a medicine, or a drug. So television can be used, television, alcohol, sex, uh, heroin. They can, uh, what, sugar can be used sugar. as a spice to spice up your life, the, the little cherry on top. Mm -hmm. It can be used as a medicine to change how you're feeling. You're in a bad mood, you have a glass of champagne, you're not in a bad mood anymore. Or you're, <laughs> you're in a bad mood, you watch some TV, now you're in a good mood, um, though TV doesn't do that. Um, or it can be used as a drug. You are so overwhelmed you just need to be dead for a little while so you drink enough to be dead or you um watch tv to be dead or you um you know whatever your drug is that makes you just dead to the world mm -hmm. you do. but i am extremely I'm, I'm very against drugs i'm not against spices um so i would also be really cognizant of i notice that you're using the, the tv not as a spice and i'm noticing that you're using it as a as a as a drug and that's a problem if you're if you need to do drugs, we need to figure out what's going on and we need to talk about it. Sure. So there's a there's a high level of, of engagement with the child through conversation, as you said, and sharing our needs as well as theirs. For, for, for the situation, I'm curious to hear your thoughts where, um, for example, in a, in a, in a family or, or any household situation where there are parents and children, you'd like the children to you know do something maybe help bring in the shopping or maybe help mow the lawn or whatever it is so you'd like them to behave in a certain way um they like to use their computer games or whatever it is that they are you know in the average household where where these things are going on and, and it goes on in mine um so what what do you think of the idea of trading is trading um uh, is, is, go ahead. Is that, is that an acceptable way of, of negotiating? Is that is is that uh, does that teeter into behaviorism? So that's a great question. Um, first, there's a kids' book called I don't know how to pronounce it, but Pell's New Coat. P e l l e. Pell's New Coat. Fantastic. It's about a little boy who wants a new coat, so he trades his way up to getting a new coat. I highly recommend it. I read okay. it to my son when he was, you know, from two to five. Yeah, uh, I think trading is awesome. Um, you just have to be really self-aware when you're doing it um, because trading can easily turn into uh, a control situation if it's not okay for that other person to refuse the trade. So if you want someone's land and they don't want to make the trade, so you shoot them, it wasn't a real problem. <laughs> um, you know, if, if your kid says no to the trade and so you punish them or you're, sure. you know, then it won't so that goes into demands and requests, doesn't it? If, if, uh, because a demand, there's consequences to a demand, but obviously a request, you're free to, to decline. Yeah. A request to trade, an offer to trade. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because I, I've, I, I try to, to trade a little bit with my children, but I, I, um, since I've heard of, of your work and your views, I started to question where that line was, you know, and uh, and it seems it seems easy, as you said, you've got to give them a let out clause. But it seems easy for trading. You know, some people call it bribery, don't they? Some people say it's bribery. If you say you can have, I don't know, an hour of of um, computer gaming for mowing the lawn, for example, is that a trade or is that a bribery? Some people would call it bribery. Do you think that's just a, a trade? That's well, not that behaviorism. Well, it would depend on some things. Is the hour of computer games on your computer? Because yeah, you should have to if if you if I'm gonna loan you my thing for an hour, sure, I would like you to do something for me in order to get my thing. Supposing but, it's just allowing, allowing. But if it's allowing, if it's the if the computer belongs to the child, now you're in some pretty dicey territory. Ah, there you go. Yes, I thought so. Does that really allow you to use your own things, like that's interesting. Hmm. So, so trade shaky ground. We've got to. I can't remember who originated this phrase, but uh, treating your child like a, a visiting dignitary from from another culture, and uh, and that that phrase often springs to my mind if I'm contemplating some. It doesn't spring to my mind in the heat of battle, unfortunately, but it usually springs to my mind afterwards. And uh, you know, and you sort of how to how to negotiate with things obviously we've got to demonstrate the right behavior we mustn't use the wrong message and and uh, you know all these things the other elements and principles of parenting around 
trusting them to do things without without getting too controlling. So there's another dimension of control, is it? Not actually wanting our children to find their own again find their own sort of barriers in the world again through that so that metaphysics that basic measuring of reality and the one example that springs to me springs to mind or there's two actually things like sort of stair gates you know these stair gates that stop children falling downstairs i mean on the face of it, it's a great idea um also the the fences around um you know jumping trampolines and things like that do are they a good thing or a bad thing if they isolate children from the consequences of their actions in, in, you could say but at the same time weighing that up against safety maybe you can speak into that do you think that's a i think that's that's great that's actually what my next book is about is depriving children of their contact with reality and i'm actually almost 100 percent of the time against um depriving children of contact with reality hmm. um so i but here's the thing um this is a really important lesson I learned. So my husband and I have a farm in the jungle in Nicaragua, and it's awesome. When we go there, our son just runs off into the forest and plays all day, and I see him at mealtimes. And um, he is, you know, he has a machete. They like to do things with their machetes. All the, all the local kids, they come over and play. They have a great time. They have a tree house. Um, they run around. They go help the grown-ups for a little while. You know, they, they do their own thing. I had another... Uh, six-year-old come to the farm who had um, been raised differently and um, and it was interesting he was so unsafe it was a real eye-opener for me so first when he got there he was there for I think two weeks he didn't know how to go outside and play he'd never he didn't he had never developed those skills so the first week was all about just trying because he he really likes to play on his computer and um, he just wanted to stay inside and play on his computer all day. So my, the process of my son, like, you know, trying to get him to come outside to play, that took a whole week. Uh -huh. Then when I finally got him outside to play, he would do really dangerous things, like climb up onto the roof of the treehouse. And all the other kids would be like, what are you doing? And so this is times. Um, he was, it was interesting. So here's another tale. Um, my son, we had a pool when he was a baby and I always let him crawl around the pool I let him uh, fall in and I would get him out and you know he only did that a couple times um, he was so safe around the pool and he really got how, um, how he really got the water and so he would crawl down a few steps and play on the steps and when he was two or three he would just like walk back and forth on the steps I never gave him floaties or anything like that um, he taught himself to swim when he was about three, just by standing on that step and jumping up and down. He learned how to swim. He always made just 100% safe decisions in terms of what he was capable of dealing with in the water. Um, you know, I have friends' kids who are were not allowed to experience the water on their own, and so they have this artificially uh, this artificial relationship with the water in which they think it's safe. So I, we went to go swim with one of my friends, and his his two month his two year old daughter would just throw herself into the water and sink. She couldn't. She would just jump in the deep end, and he'd be like, "No, no, no! You don't have your floaties on." And but she had no concept of. And it was interesting for my son to just be watching, being like, "How does she not know that you know?" <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. You sink. You can't do that. You sink. Um, but nobody ever let her sink, so she didn't know. No. It's the same thing with fires, isn't it? Because fires are obviously a very yes. contentious issue. We have a, a small holding where, where we uh, our children are very much outside, involved in, in potentially dangerous um, tasks. And, 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 you, and particularly with fires and bonfires and other things like that, you see, you see them quickly acquire... Uh, the required level of skill, don't you? Once you've grasped that fire's hot, and you know all all relevant files update, and and you just behave accordingly, don't you? But it's for children that are unused to dealing with a fire because they've had no contact with reality, or less contact well, with reality, I should say. I have a story about that. When my son was one and a half, he we went to go visit my grandparents, and they had a wood stove and a fireplace. And when we got there, I I took him close to it, and I said, "Feel hot, hot," and I took his hand and I put it close and I was like hot and he was like hot and I was like yeah he got it like that he got mm. it he um and then 
in the morning, the next morning, it wasn't hot. And he kind of, he was like, oh, look, it's not hot. So he walked over and he like put his hand, you know, he put his hands close. He, re he noticed it wasn't hot. And he, he put his hands on it. He was like, it's not hot right now. And I was like, that's right. It's not hot right now. So he immediately understood that sometimes these things are something hot. Mm. We here, we're at my aunt and uncle's house and, um, and there's, there, there's the wood stove and it's cold. It's not hot. And there's the it's been trained to never go near the wood stove ever because it's not safe. She's not allowed to go near it. And she's curious about it. She's never been able to go near it. She can't tell the difference between whether it's hot or cold because she's never been allowed to experience these things. It's to me it's so interesting. My son was one and a half and he completely safe around the wood stove. Like and as a parent, imagine how much less stress, how much you have to worry when you can trust that your kid isn't actually a idiot. Absolutely. Like, it's it's a that's an interesting point because because as people may shy away from the um, extra work involved in in uh, in paying these these this attention to the way we interact with our children and the way we parent in general, there there are huge payoffs as you say that the stress level goes down as you gain confidence in your child's um, a, a natural ability to to weigh things up what's dangerous and what isn't, and to to me I think it's a very important part of of the relationship with a child in it, it, the trust. And and the you know a certain amount of acknowledgement as well it is is a uh, as they as they act and you observe but you don't intervene sending very powerful messages isn't it and I think I think this is quite fa I mean I'm no academic and I haven't got a paper to prove it but but I imagine this might be um, foundational in in building you know the core of a of a communication a relationship where you really communicate things and you know acknowledging when when perhaps they. You know, do something well, or or or, uh, or come up with some insight. I, I love it when children come up with. They join a couple of dots in their head, and they express a concept, and you think, "Wow, that's so cool!" You know that. <laughs> you know. And they'll trust you if you're not telling them they're going to die every three seconds and hovering around them. When you do tell them, you know what you're doing really isn't safe for X, Y, and Z reasons. You know, I'm not going to stop you, but FYI, they listen to you. Um, mm. My son defers to me often, like it's fascinating. I've never told him to defer to me, but he often checks with me, is this safe? Like what, you know, how, how are we doing here? That's good. And you're, you're, you're his diplomat, aren't you? He's the, he's the dignitary <laughs> and he's saying, you know, <laughs> which way do I use the cutlery here? <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's, uh, that's so cool that you have such a wonderful relationship with your son. How old is he now? He is six and a half. Wonderful. This, this thing with story books for, for children, I, I, I struggle. Sometimes I'm reading my children's stories, um, which I don't do enough, I suppose. I, I wince at, at the philosophical implications that are sewn in them. And I think, God, I can't, so, I can't. So, so, yeah, somebody needs to go through the whole library of these books for yeah. writing. Well, OK, so then you look at the reading list because I am I do. I'm so anal about what I will read to my son. Am I? I don't know. I, I read a lot to him that I don't approve of, but I talk to him about it. But yeah. I feel like I've compiled a really good reading list, and it's on it's on my blog. And oh, um, excellent, excellent. Well, that, it, that, yeah. Let Here's, me uh, let me let me put that out to people because that's that is invaluable. That's a real thing, good thing to value. I, I, I thank you for that. I'll consult it. <laughs> yep. No, that's great, and I'll put that on the on the, on the show notes as well. We're always yeah. looking for stories that you know, new stories. Obviously, the children have their favourites, but new stories that. And um, they can even be okay, just as long as they're not really deeply just, twisted like some of them are. So the farther you go, so if you go back far enough in history, they're quite glorious. So, um, you know, Beowulf, uh, the stories of King Arthur, mm -hmm. these are uh, the, what are the histories of the kings of Britain, um, uh, Joffrey of Monmouth. These okay. are, these are historical works that you think you have to be an intellectual to read, but you don't, okay. um, that are so amazing for children. And they feature a kind of heroic man that you don't see in, um, and, and you know, you explain to your kids that these battles that they're fighting, today's battles don't look that way. No. Um, battles that we fight, this is, this is not how they look, but it's that or Superman. It's this, the, these, you know, the concretized world presented to children is the same kind of battle. Mm. So um, I, I absolutely love the, the older stuff that the, the um, my son, my son is obsessed with ancient Romans. Um, anyway, but here's a question. I should have maybe asked you this uh, a little bit earlier. But uh, my son's ten, 
my eldest, and he doesn't read yet. I mean, he, he's got a smattering of words because he picks it up off um, off computer games and this, that and the other. And I think probably also something maybe it would have been worth mentioning is a lot of houses are divided, aren't they? A lot of households, families are divided between a parent who would like to have no telly and the one, and the one who can't do without it. And uh, <clears throat> I can say this because my wife's not here at the moment, but well, she, she knows I would prefer to not have a telly. But I find the issue of computer games is a little bit contentious because I kind of want my children to have one eye on what's going on what's going on. Sorry, I don't want them to be too culturally isolated for, for fear or concern that that might just render them detached from you know the broader context of their lives. But at the same time, now you think, well, you know, you know, I'm not sure that that's that's ideal to be doing that all the time. So it's a funny old balance. Well, computer games are the most addictive drug ever invented. Mm. So they're more addictive to the human brain than meth. Um, so yeah. uh, there, there, there's really fantastic literature out there, uh, mm. and it is very divided because it's kind of like coffee, where it, or, or like alcohol, where there are some benefits, and then there are not some benefits, mm, yeah. and. So you can present either way. Um, I was raised without, I was raised completely outside of the culture. If you've ever seen the movie Captain Fantastic, that was my childhood. Um, so I'm not raising my son entirely like that. However, I will say, um, don't don't be afraid of, of being outside the culture. Um, mm. Because if nine out of every 10 children watch television, it won't matter if the 10th one watches it or not. He will still, absorb all of the cultural things sure. that probably find kids. So mm. he doesn't actually have to do it himself to absorb what they have absorbed, which is both sad and relieving. Um, and then the other, what was the other thing? Um, oh, I don't remember. But uh, no, Here's a really important one. Can I get your thoughts on this? Yeah. Does um, non-coercive parenting necessarily mean homeschooling because some might join those dots and say well se so. sending my child to school uh, does he want to go did anybody ask him you know it's does it uh, I mean do you homeschool you, you or do you uh, you do so um, do we I think that it has to um, I don't think you can send your if if you want your child he's gonna go to school and be behavior he's the behaviorist model is gonna take over hmm. so if you it, uh, by the time children are seniors in high school, they have no intrinsic motivation left whatsoever, which means they have no intrinsic selves. They have no self left. Now, I imagine it's possible with the right parent at home for them to not lose themselves entirely in school. Um, but they also might have a quite miserable experience because not having the courage to do well in school, they might conclude that they are, you know, losers. So. Yeah, so I, and also just in terms of the relationship, um, how can you have a relationship with someone that you never see whose life doesn't revolve around their yeah. family? So the, the family model of today where the wife goes here all day every day and the husband goes here all day every day and the children go here all day every day and then they all come together at night. Yeah. It's so you're traveling, it's like you're headed down five different rivers and at first it doesn't seem so big but after a couple years, everyone has gone off in such different directions mm. that you don't even know who you are. And yeah, you don't even point. you're like, who are these people? And um, you get together for family holidays and you have nothing in common. So one of the things I focus on the most um, and is, and that's because of how I was raised, is just how do you keep your family together? How do you raise individuals? Because you're going to need each other. We are mm. so different from the rest of society that you will need these people who are different like you yeah um, so it's it's an interesting balance you want your children to be individuals but you don't want to you want to make them aware consciously of well you can make that choice but it's going to send you down this river mm. and if you stand that river for too long you, you and your family will be like this yeah. and it'll be this time and so you have to decide what's more important 
Sure, and th this issue of intrinsic versus ec uh, versus extrinsic motivation is so important. Again, way back at the beginning, we touched on it with with the achievement of happiness. But once, as you su say, suggest, with with schooling and with behaviourist um, control, drumming out that sense of self and and uh, choosing your own values. I mean, that that that's shocking, isn't it? To think that to think that people, as you said earlier, you know, by the time they finish high school have no intrinsic motivation I mean that, that that that's the fuel it's like the battery's flat isn't it like come on you gotta go and live your life now and the battery would be flat if you got no controllable now the government can tell them what they want what you mm. want is a high paying job and you want to do what you're told for the rest of your life and you want to be a good little citizen and um, obey the law mm. and I I don't think you can graduate from school without having properly received those messages I mean there's a reason that school has been used since ancient Rome to change the citizens. Like when the Romans came to the UK for the first time, they took all the princes, all the all the sons of the nobles, back to Rome to be educated. Why? <laughs> that was the Romans. Yeah. God. So, are you raising an objectivist if they're going to school? Like, are you raising a person if they're going to the statist indoctrination camp? Yeah. And it's the same television and video games. Those are. That those are indoctrination camps. Like those are big businesses who have studied how to how to um, prey on your attention, how to get your attention and keep it so that you can't look away. That's why the the cuts change every three seconds or less than every three seconds now because they know that your eyes can't look away and they will mm. trap you and you will watch. These are not people who are interested in your well being. They are interested in harvesting your attention and in making money off of you. Sure. It's the same. Video games. They're not. They're not there to help your children. They're not educational tools. They're there to make money, and yeah. you're moving your children up and saying, "Here, you may make money off of them." Yeah, and this is why it also ties on with this living outside the matrix idea of, of smashing the myths. The myths of, of conventional parenting being authoritative, and all the other myths that we cover here on the show. And the and the key aspect really is 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 we need to trust our own judgment and try and think outside the box, question all of these assumptions because the 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 consequences are disastrous, aren't they? When you when you outline, you know the the, the concerns we you know with with all these aspects of control with 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 games and with film and three second two second flashes of videos, it's it's uh, ho hopefully you know, more and more people will start to consciously parent shall we say or, or parent more consciously I should say because I wouldn't want to sound elitist about in, in that concept but it does require that we pay more attention doesn't it to our choices of how we handle our children and that we respect our choices Here, mm. what's so interesting is that parents look at their children who are like this for six hours and they're like I don't like this it doesn't feel good I this feels bad but then instead of addressing that they talk themselves out of it it's fine, you know. The, the experts said that it was fine. Mm. It'll, they're, they're, the, you know, if it was bad, then the government would have banned it. Like, I don't have to worry about how I feel um, when I watch this going on. It's like you can. It's when you see it, it doesn't feel good. You, it really feels like your kid is on drugs, mm. and that is a huge alarming feeling for parents. And they don't act on it because they have something told them not to. And they don't question that. It's really interesting how parents don't stand up for themselves. No, and I, I think also that, that to the the massive increase in sort of teenage depression, there's an awful lot of it over here. I don't know about in the states, but uh, I was talking to a mother just the other day, and uh, you know, 16, 17 year old son that uh, d doesn't seem to have any direction. Obviously, no intrinsic motivation. Doesn't really know what he should be doing, and 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 it's very sad to see. You know, a, a fresh young human life, if you were, with all that potential, and yet there's 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 no spark there. There's nothing there, and, and someone's depressed. I mean, that's that's a disaster, isn't it? So, for 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 people that are interested in your book, give me the title again. Uh, my book is called A Theory of Objectivist Parenting. Fantastic. And I also have um, a Three Little Pigs, a rational version of the Three Little Pigs, because the other I. I was trying to find it to read to my son, and all I, I rented all 30 versions that they had at the library, and every single one made me angry. So, I had to <laughs> <laughs> right. 
That's something I'd like to do in another life, actually, is go through rewriting a load of kids' storybooks. Because <laughs> I, I had the hardest time. Do I want to write a, another philosophy book or do I want to rewrite all the kids' books? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you've got another book coming out, which uh, the title of that one is? You know what? It's, it's only in first draft form, so it's a good year away. And I don't know the title yet, but it'll be something along the lines of Children Belong in Reality. Okay, fantastic. And do you have a website where any um, listeners, you know, may come to, to hear more or a point of contact that you'd like to share? I do. I have a roslynross.blogspot.com or just roslynross.com can take you there too. Um, I don't post a lot. I focus on writing my books, um, but there's, but there are quite a few posts for someone who doesn't post a lot and, um, and you can definitely find really good stuff on there. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today, Roslyn. Really appreciate that and hearing all your uh, insights from your experience and, and, your, and your studies. It's marvellous. And uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for listening. I do hope you've got some value from this discussion. Maybe feel inspired to, to look into the whole concept of parenting. Um, pick up a copy of Roslyn's book. I recommend that. And uh, that'll be uh, details in the show notes. But thank you very much for listening and I do hope you'll join me again for another episode of Living Outside the Matrix. Be a change you want to see. Be a change you want to see.